Wow. Ray Walk, good morning. Good morning. So record case numbers, uh, and, and case numbers not haven't always been the numbers we've been focused on, but what role do case numbers play when you analyze where we are and where we could be heading? Well, if case numbers tell us where we are on the wave, are we going up, are we at the top, are we coming down? They tell us how likely it is that people in your vicinity, in your community, are infected, therefore how risky it is to have an unvaccinated child, for example. And they tell us um, other metrics, like what is the proportion of cases that end up hospitalized, the proportion that end up uh, dead, and so forth. So they're not without utility. They're probably less important as every day goes by, as we enter the endemicity phase of this epidemic sometime next year, probably. But right now, case numbers are important, and it's troubling that we can't get accurate ones. The frustration with the lack of available PCR testing and rapid tests is happening all over North America. A couple of examples where they stockpiled rapid tests are Saskatchewan and Alberta. How did other places not see the advantages of making sure these were available? It's a good question. Uh, rapid tests have been possibly the most underutilized tool during the past two years, and we, there's been calls by experts to use them more uh, effectively and uh, with more volume for months now. I think the slowness to adopt them in North America, as opposed to Europe, is that it was unclear how best to use them. And rapid tests are great for determining if you're infectious at a given moment, not that great for determining if you're infected. And there was concern that that's a message that's too confusing for the general public. So there was some reticence to, to make it readily available. Can you explain the difference, uh, Ray Watt? Because uh, I think uh, at first blush, uh, those two things seem very similar. They're clearly different. They're different words. Right. So you can't be infectious unless you're infected. But just because you're infected doesn't mean you're infectious. So the PCR test is very sensitive. It can find bits of virus that are so um, uh, low concentration that they don't really pose that much of a threat to your health or to other people around you. They can find that. Um, the rapid antigen test, on the other hand, only finds a positive finding if there is sufficient viral load to trigger that finding. And if it's that high, then you're probably a threat to other people. So the rapid antigen test, um, on that given day where you were tested, if you test positive, you shouldn't be around other people. Um, on the other hand, if you test negative, you still might have the virus, just that you're not have, you don't have sufficient viral load to, to be infecting other people on that day. So if you get a rapid test or if you administer a rapid test on yourself and it turns up negative, but you're feeling not necessarily all that great, uh, should we be seeking out a PCR test or should we be staying away from those lineups? Well, the PCR tests are rare, so I wouldn't seek out a PCR test. Now, Omicron has changed the game a little bit. With Omicron, especially if you're vaccinated, it's possible to have symptoms before you've got sufficient viral load to register a positive test on a rapid test. This is confusing. And, and the reason for that is, you know, um, that's how vaccines work. It, they allow your body to produce symptoms in response to uh, identify threat. Um, so if you have symptoms and you take a rapid test right away, it is likely to be negative on that first day. Consider yourself positive though. Think of yourself as a positive case, isolate, don't see anybody. The next day, do a rapid test. Then if you're infected, you're far more likely to test positive. Um, and that every day that goes by, the probability of a rapid test finding it um, gets higher. There, there are some trying to flip the conversation a little bit here, Ray Watt, with regard to Omicron and the role that it's playing right now, and also the overall effectiveness of the vaccines. You've got people suggesting, you know, that we've gone in the last month from from this being a virus and and the spread being responsible by the unvaccinated and to now because so many people are testing positive that are double vaxxed, uh, that this is now a, a virus or a, or a sickness of the vaccinated. Can, can you just clear that up a little bit for us? Oh, absolutely. It is not a sickness of the vaccinated. It is still a crisis for the unvaccinated. That's who's filling up the hospitals. The reason that Omicron is presenting itself as milder than Delta is two reasons. One is that intrinsically, it probably is a little bit milder. That's what some analyses out of the UK are finding. But more importantly, because Omicron is more likely to render a breakthrough infection, more likely to cause infection amongst the vaccinated, uh, as compared to Delta, it means the people that Omicron infects are more likely to have a milder case than the people Delta infected. Because 
Delta has little effect on the vaccinated. It's vaccination that is protecting all these people. It's vaccination that is keeping the hospitalization rates down. That's everything. If more people get vaccinated, we don't have anything resembling the crisis we have now in terms of our understaffed and overworked hospital system. Ray Watt, before we let you go, I just wanted to uh, to mention as well that I've been enjoying your uh, Twitter account uh, of late. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've been rather passionate on your social media with some of the things that you've been sharing. What's driving that, uh, that passion and making sure that the messages continue to be shared? I think um, people are getting fatigued. And also, this might be the last great battle of the COVID pandemic. It might be. And what I what, and I'm also concerned for kids under five. We forget about the kids under five, and I have one, and so there's a tendency to say let her rip, let let's get everyone get this disease right away and get herd immunity that way. No, we have to protect the kids under five as long as we can and preserve the healthcare system. So I want to get that message across that there's still a large segment of the population who we must protect. Raywat, we, normally we do a, a business uh, segment on the other side of our traffic and weather, uh, but it doesn't look like we're going to necessarily do that. I have one last question, if you don't mind. Sure. What do you make of some of these changes being contemplated with regard to asymptomatic positive persons returning to the workplace more quickly? The CDC talking about five days, but it, it, it sort of seems as though this is based on pressure uh, from airlines uh, in particular in the States and then we're seeing some provinces here in Canada making the same consideration for healthcare workers. Does that concern you at all? It does concern me for a couple of reasons. First is that the data is based on Delta data. It's not based on Omicron data that much. Second is it, yeah, I think this is uh, the result of pushback from certain private sector uh, concerns. And third is we may get there eventually. If we run out of tests entirely, then we have to manage this symptomatically, but we're not quite there yet. We still have rapid tests in abundance that we could use strategically. So what we should be doing is if you test positive and you're asymptomatic, wait until you test negative on a rapid test twice in a 24 hour period before you go back to work. You don't necessarily need a PCR test. We can preserve the PCR test for other more critical uh, purposes. So there's a lot of anger in the scientific circles about the CDC recommendations. Um, you don't want to be sitting next to someone on a bus who tested positive yesterday just because they're asymptomatic. The probability of them being transmissing is, is low, but it's not zero. Um, so long as we have rapid tests, let's use them strategically and to great effect. And this is the ideal scenario for using them. Rewat Dianand, an epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa, joining us live on 680 CJOB. Rewat, thank you very much. We appreciate this. It's my pleasure. Thank you. 815 with.